Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and you're listening to the Bible in a Year podcast, where we encounter God's voice and live life through the lens of Scripture. The Bible in a Year podcast is brought to you by Ascension. Using the Great Adventure Bible Timeline, we'll read all the way from Genesis to Revelation, discovering how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. It is day 288. If you're following the Ascension Press Bible in a Year reading plan, you know that today is the third day on the second to last page, <laughs> if that means anything to you. And we are reading today 1 Maccabees chapter 7, Sirach chapter 19, 20, and 21, as well as Proverbs chapter 22, verse 22 through 25. As always, the Bible translation that I am reading from is the Revised Standard Version, the Second Catholic Edition. I'm using the Great Adventure Bible from Ascension. If you want to download your own Bible in a Year reading plan, you can visit ascensionpress.com slash Bible in a Year. You can also subscribe to this podcast by clicking on subscribe and receiving daily episodes and updates for the next 80 days or so. 80, 81 days? I don't do good at math. Don't do well at math. Here we're going back to day 288 today. We're reading the first book of Maccabees, chapter 7, Sirach 19, 20, and 21, Proverbs 22, verses 22 through 25. The first book of Maccabees, chapter 7, Expedition of Achides and Alcimon. In the 151st year, Demetrius, the son of Seleucus, set forth from Rome, sailed with a few men to a city by the sea, and there began to reign. As he was entering the royal palace of his fathers, the army seized Antiochus and Lysias to bring them to him. But when this act became known to him, he said, Do not let me see their faces. So the army killed them, and Demetrius took his seat upon the throne of his kingdom. Then there came to him all the lawless and ungodly men of Israel. They were led by Alchemus, who wanted to be high priest. And they brought to the king this accusation against the people. Judas and his brothers have destroyed all your friends and have driven us out of our land. Now then, send a man whom you trust. Let him go and see all the ruin which Judas has brought upon us and upon the land of the king, and let him punish them and all who help them. So the king chose Bacchides, one of the king's friends, governor of the province beyond the river. He was a great man in the kingdom and was faithful to the king. And he sent him, and with him the ungodly alchemist, whom he made high priest, and he commanded him to take vengeance on the sons of Israel. So they marched away and came with a large force into the land of Judah, and he sent messengers to Judas and his brothers with peaceable but treacherous words. But they paid no attention to their words, for they saw that they had come with a large force. Then a group of scribes appeared in a body before Alchemist and Bacchides to ask for just terms. The Hasidians were first among the sons of Israel to seek peace from them, for they said, A priest of the line of Aaron has come with the army, and he will not harm us. And he spoke peaceable words to them and swore this oath to them. We will not seek to injure you or your friends. So they trusted him. But he seized 60 of them and killed them in one day in accordance with the word which was written, the flesh of your saints and their blood they poured out round about Jerusalem and there was none to bury them. Then the fear and dread of them fell upon all the people for they said, there is no truth or justice in them for they have violated the agreement and the oath which they swore. Then Bacchides departed from Jerusalem and encamped in Beth Zaith. And he sent and seized many of the men who had deserted to him and some of the people and killed them and threw them into the great pit. He placed Alchemist in charge of the country and left with him a force to help him. Then Bacchides went back to the king. Alchemist strove for the high priesthood and all who were troubling their people joined him. They gained control of the land of Judah and did great damage in Israel. And Judas saw all the evil that Alchemist and those with him had done among the sons of Israel. It was more than the Gentiles had done. So Judas went out into all the surrounding parts of Judea and took vengeance on the men who had deserted, and he prevented those in the city from going out into the country. When Alchemist saw that Judas and those with him had grown strong and realized that he could not withstand them, he returned to the king and brought wicked charges against them. Nicanor in Judea Then the king sent Nicanor, one of his honored princes, who hated and detested Israel, and he commanded him to destroy the people. So Nicanor came to Jerusalem with a large force and treacherously sent to Judas and his brothers this peaceable message. Let there be no fighting between me and you. I shall come with a few men to see you face to face in peace. So he came to Judas, and they greeted one another peaceably. But the enemy were ready to seize Judas. It became known to Judas that Nicanor had come to him with treacherous intent, and he was afraid of him and would not meet him again. When Nicanor learned that his plan had been disclosed, he went out to meet Judas in battle near Kafar Salama. About 500 men of the army of Nicanor fell, and the rest fled into the city of David. Nicanor threatens the temple. 
After these events, Nicanor went up to Mount Zion. Some of the priests came out of the sanctuary and some of the elders of the people to greet him peaceably and to show him the burnt offering that was being offered for the king. But he mocked them and derided them and defiled them and spoke arrogantly. And in anger, he swore this oath. Unless Judas and his army are delivered into my hands this time, then if I return safely, I will burn up this house. And he went out in great anger. Then the priests went in and stood before the altar and the temple, and they wept and said, You chose this house to be called by your name, and to be for your people a house of prayer and supplication. Take vengeance on this man and on his army, and let them fall by the sword. Remember their blasphemies, and let them live no longer. The Death of Nicanor Now Nicanor went out from Jerusalem, and encamped in Beth Horon, and the Syrian army joined him. And Judas encamped in Adassa with three thousand men. Then Judas prayed and said, When the messengers from the king spoke blasphemy, your angel went forth and struck down one hundred and eighty-five thousand of the Assyrians. So also crush this army before us today. Let the rest learn that Nicanor has spoken wickedly against your sanctuary and judge him according to this wickedness. So the armies met in battle on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar. The army of Nicanor was crushed, and he himself was the first to fall in battle. When his army saw that Nicanor had fallen, they threw down their arms and fled. The Jews pursued them a day's journey from Adassa as far as Gazara, and as they followed, kept sounding the battle call on the trumpets. And the men came out of all the villages of Judea round about, and they outflanked the enemy and drove them back to their pursuers, so that they all fell by the sword. Not even one of them was left. Then the Jews seized the spoils and the plunder, and they cut off Nicanor's head and the right hand, which he so arrogantly stretched out, and brought them and displayed them just outside Jerusalem. The people rejoiced greatly and celebrated that day as a day of great gladness. And they decreed that this day should be celebrated each year on the thirteenth day of Adar. So the land of Judah had rest for a few days. The Book of Sirach, Chapter 19 True Wisdom Contrasted to Cleverness and Evil A workman who is a drunkard will not become rich. He who despises small things will fail little by little. Wine and women lead intelligent men astray, and the man who consorts with harlots is very reckless. Decay and worms will inherit him, and the reckless soul will be snatched away. One who trusts others too quickly is light-minded, and one who sins does wrong to himself. One who rejoices in wickedness will be condemned, and for one who hates gossip, evil is lessened. Never repeat a conversation, and you will lose nothing at all. With friend or foe, do not report it, and unless it would be a sin for you, do not disclose it. For someone has heard you and watched you, and when the time comes, he will hate you. Have you heard a word? Let it die with you. Be brave, it will not make you burst. With such a word, a fool will suffer pangs like a woman in labor with a child. Like an arrow stuck in the flesh of the thigh, so is a word inside a fool. Question a friend, perhaps he did not do it, but if he did anything, so that he may do it no more. Question a neighbor, perhaps he did not say it, but if he did say it, so that he may not say it again. Question a friend, for often it is slander, so do not believe everything you hear. A person may make a slip without intending it. Who has never sinned with his tongue? Question your neighbor before you threaten him, and let the law of the Most High take its course. All wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and in all wisdom there is the fulfillment of the law. But the knowledge of wickedness is not wisdom, nor is there prudence where sinners take counsel. There is a cleverness which is abominable, but there is a fool who merely lacks wisdom. Better is the God-fearing man who lacks intelligence than the highly prudent man who transgresses the law. There is a cleverness which is scrupulous but unjust, and there are people who distort kindness to gain a verdict. There is a rascal bowed down in mourning, but inwardly he is full of deceit. He hides his face and pretends not to hear. But where no one notices, he will forestall you. And if by lack of strength he is prevented from sinning, he will do evil when he finds an opportunity. A man is known by his appearance, and a sensible man is known by his face when you meet him. A man's attire and open-mouthed laughter, and a man's manner of walking, show what he is. Chapter 20 on silence and speech. There is a reproof which is not timely, and there is a man who keeps silent but is wise. 
how much better it is to reprove than to stay angry, and the one who confesses his fault will be kept from loss. Like a eunuch's desire to violate a maiden is a man who executes judgments by violence. There is one who by keeping silent is found wise, while another is detested for being too talkative. There is one who keeps silent because he has no answer, while another keeps silent because he knows when to speak. A wise man will be silent until the right moment, but a braggart and fool goes beyond the right moment. Whoever uses too many words will be loathed, and whoever usurps the right to speak will be hated. There may be good fortune for a man in adversity, and a windfall may result in a loss. There is a gift that profits you nothing, and there is a gift that brings a double return. There are losses because of glory, and there are men who have raised their heads from humble circumstances. There is a man who buys much for a little, but pays for it seven times over. The wise man makes himself beloved through his words, but the courtesies of fools are wasted. A fool's gift will profit you nothing, for he has many eyes instead of one. He gives little and upbraids much. He opens his mouth like a herald. Today he lends, and tomorrow he asks it back. Such a one is a hateful man. A fool will say, I have no friend, and there is no gratitude for my good deeds. Those who eat my bread speak unkindly. How many will ridicule him, and how often? A slip on the pavement is better than a slip of the tongue, so the downfall of the wicked will occur speedily. An ungracious man is like a story told at the wrong time, which is continually on the lips of the ignorant. A proverb from a fool's lips will be rejected, for he does not tell it at its proper time. A man may be prevented from sinning by his poverty, so when he rests he feels no remorse. A man may lose his life through shame or lose it because of his foolish look. A man may for shame make promises to a friend and needlessly make him an enemy. A lie is an ugly blot on a man. It is continually on the lips of the ignorant. A thief is preferable to a habitual liar, but the lot of both is ruin. The disposition of a liar brings disgrace, and his shame is ever with him. He who speaks wisely will advance himself, and a sensible man will please great men. Whoever cultivates the soil will heap up his harvest, and whoever pleases great men will atone for injustice. Presents and gifts blind the eyes of the wise. Like a muzzle on the mouth, they avert reproofs. Hidden wisdom and unseen treasure. What advantage is there in either of them? Better is the man who hides his folly than the man who hides his wisdom. Chapter 21 Various Sins and Foolishness Have you sinned, my son? Do so no more, but pray about your former sins. Flee from sin as from a snake. For if you approach sin, it will bite you. Its teeth are lion's teeth and destroy the souls of men. All lawlessness is like a two-edged sword. There is no healing for its wound. Terror and violence will lay waste riches. Thus, the house of the proud will be laid waste. The prayer of a poor man goes from his lips to the ears of God and his judgment comes speedily. Whoever hates reproof walks in the steps of the sinner, but he that fears the Lord will repent in his heart. He who is mighty in speech is known from afar, but the sensible man, when he slips, is aware of it. A man who builds his house with other people's money is like one who gathers stones for his burial mound. An assembly of the wicked is like tow gathered together, and their end is a flame of fire. The way of sinners is smoothly paved with stones, but at its end is the pit of Hades. Whoever keeps the law controls his thoughts, and wisdom is the fulfillment of the fear of the Lord. He who is not clever cannot be taught, but there is a cleverness which increases bitterness. The knowledge of a wise man will increase like a flood and his counsel like a flowing spring. The mind of a fool is like a broken jar. It will hold no knowledge. When a man of understanding hears a wise saying, he will praise it and add to it. When a reveler hears it, he dislikes it and casts it behind his back. A fool's narration is like a burden on a journey but the light will be found in the speech of the intelligent. The utterance of a sensible man will be sought in the assembly, and they will ponder his words in their minds. Like a house that has vanished, so is wisdom to a fool, and the knowledge of the ignorant is unexamined talk. To a senseless man, education is chains on his feet, and like manacles on his right hand. A fool raises his voice when he laughs, but a clever man smiles quietly. 
To a sensible man, education is like a golden ornament and like a bracelet on the right arm. The foot of a fool rushes into a house, but a man of experience stands respectfully before it. A boor peers into the house from the door, but a cultivated man remains outside. It is ill-mannered for a man to listen at a door, and a discreet man is grieved by the disgrace. The lips of strangers will speak of these things, but the words of the prudent will be weighed in the balance. The mind of fools is in their mouth, but the mouth of wise men is in their mind. When an ungodly man curses his adversary, he curses his own soul. A whisperer defiles his own soul and is hated in his neighborhood. The book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verses 22 through 25. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and despoil of life those who despoil them. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Father in heaven, we give you praise and we offer you our thanksgiving today. Um, thank you for continuing to direct us the right way to walk. We ask you to help us not only to know the right way to walk, but to choose it. Not only to know the right way to live, but to actually live that way. Uh, we, without your grace, Lord God, we can, we can know, but we can't do. We can, we can be aware of, but we can't act. So please help us not only to know your law, to know your will, to know your wisdom, but to be wise and to walk in your law and to walk in your will this day and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, well, what we have in the first book of Maccabees, as happened last time, I mean, whenever we read any of the books of Chronicles, the books of the Kings, the books of Joshua, the book of Judges, is that, you know, one king rises and then falls. Another king rises and another falls. We have all of this uh, rising and falling, and yet, here are the Jewish people. They continue to fight. We had uh, now the rise of Demetrius, the son of Seleucus, right? The Seleucid Empire is a kind of a big deal, came after Alexander the Great. And Demetrius is now waging war uh, against the Israelites as well, right? He killed Antiochus and Lysias, and he sends Bacchides, Bacchides. You never know how to say these names. We went to, from Jewish names, no problem, Hebrew names, to Greek names, and it's all, it's all, what do you say? It's all Greek to me. So, we just kind of pick away and we go move forward with it. But what we have is, once again, the witness of Judas Maccabeus and the men of Israel. And what are they doing? They go into battle, but they always pray ahead of time. Now, there is a great wisdom here. And the great wisdom that is offered to us is what we have learned so many times before. You and I are called to battle, right? We are battle, as I've said a thousand times, is not with flesh and blood, it's with principalities and powers. But what do we do as Christians? We have to, have to pray and say, Lord, the battle belongs to you. Lord God, the victory belongs to you. And so what, I, what we need to do is we need to call upon the name of the Lord whenever we enter into battle. Because, you know, this is a, a translation into the spiritual battle that we all experience in the book of Sirach, chapter 19. Gosh, how incredible has, is, is this? Um, the spiritual battle of true wisdom contrasted to cleverness and evil. And man, so good. For, for example, never repeat a conversation. How about that? How about that for a, uh, for a piece of wisdom? Never repeat a conversation and you will lose nothing at all. Right before this, this is chapter 19. In verse four, one who trusts others too quickly is light-minded. Wow. Again, we already talked about what it is to having to test a friend before we trust a friend. But here, the one who trusts others too quickly is light-minded. How about this? One who rejoices in wickedness will, will be condemned. And for one who hates gossip, evil is lessened. So one who rejoices in wickedness will be condemned. Um, you know, sometimes we rejoice in wickedness in terms of we might be happy when uh, if someone has sinned. Other times, we are happy when someone's sin is found out. You know, someone that we don't like is what I'm saying. Not just a matter of justice, but in a matter of vengeance, right? Where I, it turns out that, oh, so-and-so is, is not as good as we thought. Hooray. That kind of that, that personal little enjoyment inside. And yet, man, here's the scripture. One who rejoices in wickedness will be condemned. Never repeat a conversation. Goes on to say, with friend or foe, do not report it. And unless it will be a sin for you, do not disclose it. For someone has heard you and watched you. And when the time comes, he will hate you. I love this. Have you heard a word? Again, a word of gossip. Let it die with you. <laughs> this is, and this is, gosh, you guys, if, if you struggle with gossip, this is, okay, Sirach chapter 19 is going to be your friend. 
Have you heard a word? Let it die with you. Be brave. It will not make you burst. <laughs> oh, man. I have this thing I have to say. I just have to say it. You guys, I just have to say this, right? That's what we say. Be brave. It will not make you burst. With such a word, a fool will suffer pangs like a woman in labor with child, like an arrow stuck in the flesh of the thigh. So is a word inside a fool. Man, so good. Because we can be tempted. Always, I just have to say this. You know what? Okay, don't repeat this, but here's the thing, right? How many times have we said something like that? It goes on. Question a friend. Maybe you didn't do it. Question your neighbor. Maybe they didn't say it. Question a friend. Maybe it's slander against them. And that sense of, gosh, give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, there, there's a, a teaching in one of the rules of living for monastery, you know, monk people, people are monks living in monasteries. And one of those rules is always assume the goodwill of your brother or your sister, which I think is a great wisdom and, and a great guideline for us, no matter where we live, whether it be a convent or a monastery or just in our house with our family, always assume the goodwill of your brother or of your sister. And so this is what's happening here in Sirach is that sense of being able to say, hey, before you make a judgment, question the friend. Maybe they didn't do it. Maybe they didn't mean it like that. Ah, oh, okay, you guys, there is so much wisdom here. I think that we just have to highlight one last piece because I think going through Sirach, it's, it's worth turning these jewels of wisdom over and over in our minds and writing them down, maybe writing them on little postcards or maybe in your notebook. We have an insight journal if you want to, to write that down there and be able to say, okay, I'm capturing this piece of wisdom for myself or for my, my, my child or for my, my niece or nephew, whoever that person is, but to write that down and capture it. One last note, and it comes from the end of chapter 20. <sighs> There's something about wisdom and wise speech. So he goes on to say in chapter 20, verse 19, an ungracious man is like a story told at the wrong time, <laughs> which is continually on the lips of the ignorant. I mean, how, how often are we like this? A proverb from a fool's lips will be rejected, for he does not tell it at its proper time. There's something in this, because um, you know, the author of Sirach goes on to mention this a couple times. This ill-placed, misplaced piece of wisdom ceases to be wise, right? That, that here's a story that could be helpful, a story that could contribute at some point, but not at this point. And there is the gift of prudence, right? The gift of prudence is, is doing the right thing at the right time in the right way. And this is one of the reasons why wisdom is so practical. <laughs> prudence is so practical, doing the right thing at the right time in the right way. And going back to this, an ungracious man is like a story told at the wrong time, which is continually on the lips of the ignorant. A proverb from a fool's lips will be rejected for he does not tell it at its proper time. Um, I just go back to that again, that, that gift of prudence, that spirit of prudence, that ability to know, okay, I can do the right thing at the right time in the right way. I can say the right thing at the right time in the right way. Um, to have that gift is, it's a gift, <laughs> not only a gift to yourself, it's a gift to the people around us. Ah, but our time of speaking is over now because we have the word of God in our hearts and in our ears, shaping the way we see, and hopefully shaping the way we speak the way we look, the way we live, and the way we love each other and the Lord. I am praying for you. Please pray for me. My name is Father Mike. I cannot wait to see you tomorrow. God bless.